Well, good evening, everyone. So good to be here, and I'm thankful for what the Lord's going to do this week. And so I'm just going to say a brief prayer as well to ask the Lord to, to be with me as I speak, and we'll get right into the message. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for the soon approaching Sabbath hours, and we thank you that we can rest in you. And I pray now that you would give me clarity of thought as I share on this message of justification by faith. I pray that it will come across in a way that will be a blessing and a help to, to each one of us. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So the title for the message this evening is Justification by Faith and the Third Angel's Message. And I believe that if you haven't already seen this already, by the time we end the message this evening, you're going to see just how important justification by faith is, how important it is to understand what justification by faith is, and how important it is to experience biblical justification by faith. So that's what we are going to look at this evening. I'm going to start with a familiar statement from Ellen White in Review and Herald, April 1, 1890. I'm going to read a couple of statements from her, and then we're going to get into the Bible. And this is a familiar statement to many of us, but it certainly is worth digging into deeper. So let's look at this statement. Review and Herald, April 1, 1890. Several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message, and I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. The prophet declares, and after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Brightness, glory, and power are to be connected with the third angel's message, and conviction will follow wherever it is preached in demonstration of the Spirit. Here's the first thing that I, that I know. If justification by faith is the third angel's message in verity or in certainty or in truth, I want to know what justification by faith is. And I want to have justification by faith. I want to experience justification by faith because it is the third angel's message in verity and a lot of times we read that statement and we don't see how it's connected in the very next sentence to revelation 18 1 with the angel coming down from heaven having great power the earth is lightened with its glory that's the experience of the latter rain where the latter rain is poured out and the loud cry is given and the earth not simply hears the proclamation of God's message for the last days, it sees a demonstration of it. So here's one of the things that I see from this statement. Yes, justification by faith is the third angel's message in verity or in certainty. But the other thing that I see is that when we as God's people experience justification by faith, the latter rain will be poured out. Now, here's something that is a little less comfortable to accept, but it's a reality. Here's something that we cannot deny. The latter rain has not yet been poured out, and the loud cry has not yet been given. We're still waiting for that. Now, I, th I believe we're getting closer. But the reality is we are still waiting for the prophetic fulfillment of Revelation 18.1. Now, as Seventh-day Adventists, we have the privilege of living under the prophetic fulfillment of the proclamation of the three angels messages which we, when we study that prophetically we understand ever since 1844 the hour of god's judgment has come the three angels messages are the prophetic relevant messages of the hour since that time we are living in the three angels messages but the loud cry of revelation 18 is still in the future prophetically and because that is true you know what that means that tells me that we as Seventh-day Adventists are still waiting to truly experience justification by faith the way God designs for it to be experienced. You know why? Because it is the third angel's message in verity, and Revelation 18 is a proclamation and demonstration of the three angel's messages. 
it's not simply a proclamation it's a demonstration of that which is experienced by god's people so in other words the latter rain is poured out by the holy spirit where the earth is illuminated with the glory of god's character because god's people have an experience to share and the world not simply sees or they, they not simply they don't simply hear the proclamation of the message they see a demonstration of what that means and so justification by faith is the third angel's message in verity because when god's people experience it the latter rain will be poured out so that the loud cry can be given now when the earth is lightened with god's glory god's glory is his character and that means that god has a righteous people by faith who are declaring the experience of what god has given them that's what we're going to develop through the rest of this message so i just gave you in a, a little bit of a nutshell where we're going to go but i'm going to prove it to you from the bible it's an interesting statement from review and herald of april 1 1890 there's one other statement this is testimonies to ministers page 91 because historically the message of justification by faith came to the adventist church as we're familiar with in the 1880s and and it's especially we call it the 1888 message of jones and wagner now, again this uh, i'm not necessarily defining it the way some people define it i'm going to just allow inspiration to define justification by faith and this is a statement from testimonies to ministers page 91 the lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through elders wagner and jones this message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted savior the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world it presented justification through faith in the surety so clearly justification by faith was a key component to the most precious message that god sent to his people through elders wagner and jones then it said it invited the people to receive the righteousness of christ which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of god many had lost sight of jesus now i'm not going to spend a whole lot of time about 1888 but i think you may have heard of this before but in the 1880s leading up to that time adventists many had lost, lost sight of jesus and we as a church were very good debaters and argumentative we could make ministers and members of other non seventh day adventist churches look really bad when it came to an understanding of the bible and we could prove why the ten commandments are binding and all of that kind of thing but we had lost sight of jesus now there may be an overcorrection in some circles today but the reality is is that the message that god wants us to receive is is the same as it has always been the everlasting gospel is the same as it has always been and we need to be careful that as we come to an understanding of biblical truth that we don't lose sight of jesus in the midst of that and so the message also this quote goes on to say about the message they needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person his merits and his changeless love for the human family all power is given into his hands go and then it goes on to say this is the message that god commanded to be given to the world it is the third angel's message was to, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure so the message of justification by faith now you may be thinking i think i pretty much know what justification by faith is and i would say that i would it would be fair to assume that probably most of you who are sitting here this evening could give a pretty good biblical definition of justification by faith however as i've studied justification by faith in the last couple of years i'm seeing certain aspects about the experience of justification by faith that we as god's people desperately need and that's what i'm going to be talking about tonight so in romans chapter 4 it's interesting paul starts to define 
what it looks like to have justification by faith. And he starts in Romans chapter 4, describing Abraham, who's the father of faith. He says, what shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to be counted righteous, that's justification. And then verse 4 says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Sometimes there's this mentality that, you know, if I work really hard to become successful in my career, I studied really hard, I put lots of effort into it, then I probably will have to work really hard to earn salvation. That's a mentality that some people can have. The Bible's very clear that if Abraham, the father of faith, were justified by his works. Now, we can point to some of his bad works, but we could also point to some of Abraham's good works, which Paul talks about in chapter 4. Abraham believed that God could bring him and Sarah together to have a child when they're past childbearing age. Abraham believed that God could raise Isaac from the dead when there had never been a resurrection, and he was going to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice. And if Scripture said that's why Abraham is justified, because he did those things, then we would say, wow, look at the glory of Abraham's works, but that's not what the Bible teaches. Abraham is justified by faith. He wasn't, we can't pay off the debt of our sin. Now that's pretty basic. God it also describes in Revelation, or excuse me, Romans 3.24, that it says being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It's this rich, free gift that we receive. No merit on our part. So there's this justification that we need. Well, why do we need to be justified? Because we've all sinned. Every single one of us here acknowledges that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we need God's grace. We need his justification. Faith and Works, page 103, says pardon and justification are one and the same thing. In other words, forgiveness. Pardon, forgiveness, and justification are one and the same thing. So to be forgiven is to be justified. Does that make sense? And the quote goes on to say, through faith, the believer passes from the position of a rebel, a child of sin and Satan, to the position of a loyal subject of Christ Jesus. Now, if you think about that, we go simply by God's grace, by having faith, we go from being a child of sin and Satan to being a subject of Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? And the only way that's possible is because Jesus died for us on the cross, and through his blood, we accept by faith, the efficacy of the blood of Jesus to forgive us, and we accept that his righteous life gives us the merit that we don't have. That's all very clear and very biblical. And 1 John 1, 9 very clearly says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We understand that. But here's something that I want to challenge you on. You know, sometimes in some circles of Adventism, we will talk about victory over sin and having faith to believe that God can give us victory over every sin in our lives. And I'm going to talk about that tomorrow morning and probably a little bit more tonight as well. But do you really believe that you are forgiven for your sins? And do you live knowing that you're forgiven? Because if you don't live by faith in a way where you relate to God, where you're thankful to him for the forgiveness of your sins, then you're not really experiencing forgiveness and you're not really experience, experiencing justification by faith. Like you think about the sins of your past and, oh, and I did that in college and then I did that. Oh, and that was... And then you're not accepting the blood of Jesus. Like one of my friends, one time I heard him giving a sermon and he's like, how many of you are checking the washing machine to make sure the detergent is cleaning the clothes when the, the clothes are going through the washing machine? Nobody does that. But how can we question the blood of Jesus to cleanse us of our sins? Do we really believe that we've been forgiven? And that's such an important part of justification by faith. It takes faith to believe 
that because look we know our hearts and Ellen White says the closer we come to the Lord the more sinful we appear in our own eyes because we see how malignant sin is but with that understanding of how sinful we are do we then really trust the blood of Jesus to forgive us if you don't you're not justified by faith that's why Romans 5 verse 1 says, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So being justified leads to having peace with God. And that's something that nobody can take away from you. You can be maligned and criticized and labeled or whatever it may be, but if you know that God has forgiven your sins and you're at peace with him, then you can, you can be at peace among the most hostile situations because you know, you know that you're right with God. So believing in the forgiving grace of God is so important. And sometimes, you know, you'll hear people talk about victory, but I, I had a friend who could give as good of a message on victory over sin as anyone I've known, and yet he really struggled believing that he'd been forgiven, and then it showed in certain choices that he made in his life. So this isn't just some theoretical thing that I'm sharing. This is something that I'm seeing that if we're going to experience justification by faith so that we can receive the outpouring of the latter rain and to give the loud cry, we must be a forgiven people that know that we are forgiven. That has to be part of our experience. But, you know, part of being forgiven also means that we are forgiving. So God forgives me, and I mean, you know, I'm not going to list all of the things that I needed God's grace for to be forgiven for. We could all put a laundry list of stuff on a whiteboard, and it wouldn't be a pretty picture. But thankfully, God in his mercy has forgiven us. What happens, though, when you get hurt? Now, some of us are so petty that we won't even forgive our spouse when they kind of looked at us sideways three days ago, and we're still kind of getting over that. Now, we got to move past that. But I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about, you know, we're talking about deep issues here. You know, there are some of you here this evening who have been deeply wronged by other people. And from a human standpoint, you have every right, just from a human standpoint, if you leave Christianity out of the equation, you have every right to have an ax to grind with that person and to be hurt and to be angry and to be upset, whatever it may be, but that's not the Christian gospel. You know, Psalm 86, verse 5 says, God is good and ready to forgive. How about us? You know, it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And as the goodness of God leads us to repentance, one of the things that we see in ourselves, one of the things that I've seen about myself, is that, humanly speaking, I'm not very forgiving when somebody hurts me. Yet God is ready to forgive me as soon as I come to him asking for forgiveness. Sometimes, though, my natural tendency, if somebody hurts me, is like, man, that was bad. Do you realize that? That was bad. Let me talk to you first about all of the ways this was upsetting and hurtful to me, and then I'll have a time of consideration as to whether or not I'm going to forgive you. That's my human nature. I'm sure some of you can identify with the way my tendencies are. But listen, if we're going to experience justification by faith, first we need to believe that God is good and is ready to forgive us and that he does forgive us and that we have been forgiven. And as God forgives us, we forgive others. Matthew 6, we know these verses, but I'm just putting these, and this is just kind of laying a foundation for where we're headed here. Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So in other words, if you expect for the Lord to forgive you for your mistakes, 
it's not going to happen if you have an unforgiving heart towards somebody else. And the reason why is this. Being unforgiving is a sin. And if you're not repentant for having an unforgiving heart, the Lord can't forgive you for that. You have to be sorry for being unforgiving as well. So, I realize this is basic, but you'd be surprised how many Seventh-day Adventists struggle with these things on an experiential level. Now, you may say, oh, we're not that bad. Well, really? Then how come you're still mad at that brother or sister about what happened at the church board meeting three months ago? Now, by the way, Pastor Arnall has not given me any recent updates, so I have no idea what's going on here. <laughs> so, I, I don't know if there's d anything like that. You get my point, though. I've been to enough churches that every church I've been at, there's somebody who's holding a grudge over something that happened at a board meeting where it was a contested point and, you know, we laugh about, it. oh, they were fighting over the car color of the carpet. Sometimes it's bigger than that. It's a building committee issue over how much money we're going to spend or how we should spend the money or whatever it is. And 10 years later, we're still mad about how the vote went. And we'll be very friendly and kind to the people that we like and that see things the way we see them. And we come into church Sabbath morning and give them a handshake and a hug. And we may follow social distancing precautions that are still friendly in the age of COVID. You get the point. And then the next person comes along that upset us 10 years ago at the church board meeting, and we won't even make eye contact with them. So when we're talking about the experience of justification by faith, this is very practical and very personal and gets to the very heart of how we're living. We, yes, we believe that God is good and that he is ready and willing to forgive us of every sin in our lives, but are we forgiving towards those who have hurt us? And you know what? Sometimes when you forgive someone, there's no guarantee that they will ever come and say, I'm sorry for how I hurt you. Being forgiving towards someone who has hurt you might mean that they never apologize from now through this, throughout eternity, and we hope that they'll be in the kingdom, but there's some people who might have hurt us who will never make things right. And are you going to be unforgiving towards them? So we experience justification by faith when we accept God's forgiving grace and by faith when we forgive as God forgives. And that takes the grace of God as well. Because humanly speaking, there's some people, if it was just up to me without the grace of the Lord, I'd be good to never see them the rest of my life. <laughs> and we laugh, but we all have those people in our lives. And how do we relate to them in our heart and in our mind? Now, justification by faith as you can see, forgiveness is a key aspect, but there's more to justification than even forgiveness. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 114, says God's forgiveness is not merely a judicial act by which he sets us free from condemnation. It is not only forgiveness for sin, but reclaiming from sin. It is the outflow of redeeming love that transforms the heart. So God, when he forgives us and when he justifies us, it's not for the purpose of for us to stay in a life of sin. So if I come to the Lord and say, Lord, I am so sorry that I've had a heart of bitterness towards brother or sister so-and-so at church or maybe in my own home or whatever it is, Lord, I need your forgiveness. When God forgives me and I experience his grace and I experience his justification, he is not merely proclaiming, well, I've performed a legal act in heaven where I've forgiven you, and that's too bad that you're going to continue to be bitter towards your brother, but at least you're forgiven for it. That's not what, what God does. When God forgives us, he also, as we by faith ask for forgiveness, he also touches our hearts so that now my heart changes. 
So the sin for, that, that I committed, that I'm asking forgiveness for, God now changes my heart so that I'm reclaimed from that sin. So that instead of being angry, grumpy, bitter, unforgiving, now by the grace of God, I have the same forgiving spirit. And we see it says, it is the outflow of redeeming love that transforms the heart. Now, humanly speaking, this is not possible, but through the grace of God, it is. And notice this statement from Faith and Works, page 100. But while God can be just and yet justify the sinner through the merits of Christ, no man can cover his soul with the garments of Christ's righteousness while practicing known sins or neglecting known duties. Now, this is where the rubber meets the road because some people teach justification by faith in a manner that says you can be legally justified even though your life is still full of sin and that's one of the reasons why i believe that we as a seventh day adventist church continue to struggle with laodiceanism and worldliness and why the latter rain has not yet been poured out upon God's people because we're not really experiencing justification by faith in the way God wants us to experience it from a biblical standpoint. So this statement says, no man can cover his soul with the garments of Christ's righteousness while practicing known sins or neglecting no duties. Now notice this next sentence. God requires the entire surrender of the heart before justification can take place. You know, there's just some people I don't want to forgive. And it takes surrender to say, okay, Lord, I don't want to do this. They hurt me. And they hurt me badly. You know, I, I have friends who their spouse walked out on them for somebody else. That hurts. Humanly speaking, that's impossible to forgive being fired from your job over unfair false accusations that hurts humanly speaking that's not easy to forgive but by the grace of god when we surrender our hearts entirely to him now we receive his grace and as he is good and ready to forgive us we receive his goodness by faith so that we can forgive those who have hurt us that's a miracle of God. But it takes place when we surrender our hearts to him. God requires the entire surrender of the heart before justification can take place. And in order for man to retain justification, there must be continual obedience through active living faith that works by love and purifies the soul. So here's the thing. When my heart is now surrendered to the Lord, that's like Galatians 2.20 where it says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. So if my heart is entirely surrendered to the Lord, it's now no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives through me. And when my heart is surrendered and Christ lives through me, now he lives out an obedient life through me. That's what happens when I surrender to him. That's another miracle of grace. Because we all know what it's like to try to obey without the grace of God. It just doesn't go too well. So, experientially, justification by faith it's easy to say, oh yes, it's forgiveness. When God forgives me, I'm justified. Yes, that's true. But you, you see here how that deals with the deepest heart level issues that we struggle with because I don't feel like forgiving people that are mean to me. I don't feel like forgiving people who may never ever apologize for how they hurt me. But by the grace of God, in order for me to experience justification by faith, by his grace and love, I will forgive that person. And when that happens, I now experience justification by faith. But if I'm not forgiving that person, then I'm still living in sin because to be unforgiving is sinful. And God can't give me justification when I'm not forgiving. 
Now, there's more to it than what I've just said, but this is an interesting start. So surrender is a key element of justification by faith. And remember the opening statement, justification by faith is the third angel's message in verity. Now, justification by faith as the third angel then means that God will have a people in his church who understand what it means by experience to accept the forgiving grace of God and to forgive as God forgives. Humanly speaking, I can't do that, but by the grace of God, I can. So that when the earth is lightened with the glory of God's character, you know, sometimes we say, yeah, when the loud cry goes out, and listen, I believe this part of the loud cry. The loud cry, when it goes out, it's going to identify that Babylon the great is fallen, has fallen, has become the habitation of devils, the hold of every unclean spirit and the habitation of every unclean and hateful bird it will show who the beast power is and that they are babylon and that they are fallen in the habitation of demons and all those things but sometimes as seventh day adventists we're like i just pray that the latter rain will be poured out so that we can give the loud cry message so that we can identify who the beast is so that people will come out and yet we can't even forgive each other at church and God is saying, I'm going to have a people who show the world what it's like to receive my grace, what it's like to receive my forgiveness, and what it's like to be forgiving as I'm forgiving, to be Christ-like. Yes, to be an overcomer does mean that you stop doing bad things and that you gain victory over sin. But you know one of the things that we struggle with the most at an experiential level is to be forgiving as God is forgiving. And, of course, it builds from there. This is the third angel's message in verity. When we see how God has forgiven us, when we see Jesus hanging on the cross, and he died on the cross, yes, as the sacrifice of, for the sins of the whole world, but also for me personally. And when I see in Jesus a personal Savior for me, I realize that there is nothing that anybody can do to me that Jesus' sacrifice can't deal with that what he has done for me allows me to extend grace to everybody else. That's what I need, that's what you need. That's what we all need. This is the third angel's message in Verity. Now, I'm going to take you some Bible passages that I find to be very helpful and enlightening that helps us to understand how God's people are going to live with this experience of justification by faith in the last days. We're going to pick it up in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35. Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 35, which says, Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Now that patience is also, it means endurance. It's the same word in Revelation 14, 12. It's the same word in Hebrews 12, 1, where it says, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. You know, the Christian experience is a call for endurance because in this world of sin, as we keep our eyes on Jesus, yes, we are surrounded by sinners who don't follow God. For you have need of patience or endurance that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. What's the promise? Verse 37, for, yellow, for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry or will not delay. So in other words, the promise that you will receive when you have endurance is the second coming of Jesus. Amen? You know, we've been waiting a while now, and there is this delay that has been discussed in Scripture. You can see it in Matthew 25. And yes, there is a delay, but eventually, in yet a little while, he that shall come will come. So how are we to live? It says we're to have endurance or patience. But verse 38 goes on to say, now the just shall live by faith. Now the word just here in the Greek is the Greek word dikaios, which means righteous. The righteous shall live by faith. So what God is saying is that before Jesus comes back, there will be a people who have patience or endurance 
who are righteous, who live by faith. The righteous, the just, shall live by faith, who have patience or endurance. And those who are righteous, who are living by faith, are the ones who will be ready when Jesus comes. Now that seems pretty basic. But there's some deep meaning here. Romans 1, 16 and 17, Paul also uses this phrase and builds on this thought about what it means for the just to live by faith. Romans 1, 16 and 17 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, then verse 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So Paul is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it has power, and the Greek word for power is dunamis. It's like dynamite. So there's something about the gospel that has dynamite power. And whether you are a Jew or a Greek, if you have faith, if you believe... You can receive this power. Now, what is it that gives the gospel power? Verse 17 tells us what gives the gospel power. Verse 17 says, for therein, meaning in the gospel. So what gives the gospel power? Well, in the gospel, it says the righteousness of God is revealed. This is interesting. It's not simply declared. Now, in the 1970s and 80s, Desmond Ford came along and said, Paul understood the gospel better than Jesus because he articulated it. The the, the synoptic gospels in Matthew through John are a description of Jesus' life, and you can kind of see the gospel personified. But Paul describes the gospel theologically in the book of Romans, and the gospel theologically means that to be righteous is to be declared righteous only. That's what Desmond Ford taught. And then he said, because to be righteous is to be declared righteous only, and sin will remain but not reign, then there's really no point in a judgment, because why would there, need to, why would there be the need for a judgment if we're all going to have sin in our lives anyway, and we're just covered by the blood of Jesus? That's what Desmond Ford taught. And yet Paul, at the outset of the book of Romans, says, let me tell you why the gospel is so powerful. The gospel is powerful because when you believe in the dunamis, dynamite power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you not simply receive declared righteousness. The righteousness of God is revealed in the lives of those who have faith. And those who are waiting for the coming of Jesus, so you connect what Paul says in Hebrews 10 with Romans 1, those who are waiting for the coming of Jesus with endurance are the just who live by faith. And if you are the just who live by faith, you are justified by faith. So clearly those who are waiting for the coming of Jesus are justified by faith, meaning that they believe by faith that their sins are forgiven because we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we believe in the forgiving grace of Jesus and we are forgiving as he is forgiven forgiving and by faith we are righteous and it's not simply a legal righteousness yes it's a legal righteousness god declares us to be righteous but it's a righteousness that is revealed The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. It's interesting. This word just, as I said, is the Greek word dikaios. And there's at least three examples in the New Testament in which this word dikaios is used to describe Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 27, 19, as Jesus is on trial, Pilate's wife has this terrible dream, and we see in Desire of Ages that she sees Jesus in Pilate's judgment hall, and then she's taken to the end of time when she sees Jesus coming back as King of kings and Lord of lords, and she sends a message to her husband, Pilate, and it says in her message, have nothing to do with this just man. And that word in the Greek is dikaios, have nothing to do with this just, dikaios, man. 
Well, that's the testimony of a pagan Roman woman. But then in Acts 3.14, Peter speaking to the Pharisees and the leaders of the Jewish nation says, you denied the Holy One and the just. And that's the word decaos. And then in Acts 7.52, Stephen, just before he is stoned to death, says, They have slain them which show before of the coming of the just one, of whom you have now been the betrayers and murderers. Again, Jesus is described as just or righteous. And this is what Paul is trying to say. The reason why the gospel has power is because when you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, in the dunamis, dynamite power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, God can use the power of the gospel to blow up your sin-polluted heart and plant the seed of his righteousness in your life so that his righteousness will grow up into your life so that the righteousness of God is not simply declared by your life, it's revealed through your life. That's justification by faith. Yes, there's a growing experience in maturity. It's not as if you are the full measure of the man of Christ Jesus, so to speak, on day one of your conversion. But Ellen White tells us in Christ's Object Lessons that at every stage of, the li of a Christian's life, he can be perfect because it's first the blade, then the ear, and then eventually the full corn in the ear. And at the end of time, when the latter rain is poured out, the latter rain is poured out on a ripened harvest that is mature and ready for the final crisis. Now, this is just kind of a passing point, but I'll say this. We should be thankful that the latter rain has not yet been poured out. You know why? Because the worst thing that could happen is for less than fully ripened fruit to try to go through earth's final crisis we don't need selfish proud unforgiving embittered power-seeking seventh-day adventist men and women to be christ representatives through the final crisis we need humble righteous forgiving loving Seventh-day Adventist men and women who have been changed by Jesus. Now, there have always been some in the church, don't get me wrong. It's not like those people have never existed. But God is looking for more people. So, the reason why the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message in verity is because the third angel's message is a description of the righteous or the just who are like Jesus, who live by faith. This experience produces the loud cry under the power of the latter rain. Now, there are four places in the Bible that the phrase, the just shall live by faith, is found. I've shown you two of those places. Hebrews 10, 35 through 39, Romans 1, 16 and 17. It's also found in the book of Galatians. And then the first place that it's mentioned, the very first place, is found in the book of Habakkuk. And this is very fascinating. Go to Habakkuk chapter 2, one of the minor prophets. And this kind of ties everything together as, as I'm kind of coming down to my last main point here in the next several minutes. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4 says, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Now you may wonder, so how did Paul take Habakkuk 2, verse 4, and then apply that in Romans 1, 17 to the power of the gospel, and apply that to the righteous who live by faith, who are waiting for the coming of Jesus, and he applies it to righteousness by faith in the book of Galatians. How did he take that one verse and make that application, and what does that have to do with justification by faith, as we've been talking about this evening? What does that have to do with forgiveness, and being forgiving, and being surrendered? What does that have to do with all of that? Well, to me, this is a very profound passage, and I think you're going to see something very meaningful, and special, and powerful from this passage. Habakkuk, in chapter 1, we see that the Chaldeans or the Babylonians are on, or they're threatening to overrun God's people. And your prophetic antenna should be going up because at the end of the world, God's last day people, the remnant church, 
have an enemy known as spiritual Babylon who are looking to overrun God's people. And if Babylon overruns you, you will receive the mark of the beast. I think it's safe to say that those who are not justified by faith will receive the mark of the beast. Well, Babylon's about to overrun God's people, or they're threatening to overrun God's people. So in chapter 2, we see a message of how to withstand this attack from Babylon. Chapter 2, verse 1 says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Now, here's what the prophetic messenger is saying. The Chaldeans are trying to overrun God's people, and so I'm going to stand at the watchtower. Now, the watchman on the wall would warn of the enemy that was approaching, and if he gave the right message in the right amount of time, the people who were being threatened could be saved from the the attack of the approaching enemy. And what the prophetic messenger is saying here is, there is a message that is going to come to me as the watchman that I will share with God's people that will save them from the attack of the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. And this message that is going to come to me is a message of reproof. And if I receive this message of reproof, I will be able to spiritually withstand the attack of the Babylonians. So I want to know what this message of reproof is that God's going to send to his messenger, don't you? Because if you know what the message of reproof is, then you will be able to withstand the deceptions and the attacks of the Babylonians. So then verses 2 and 3 come. It says, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Now, for those of you who have studied the Adventist message, do you know what vision this is referring to in Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2 and 3? It's the vision of the 2300 days. You know, the Millerites thought that Jesus was going to come by the spring of 1844, and so they went through their early disappointment, and then they came and they were led to this passage in Habakkuk 2, and they realized, oh wait, um, the vision that we have been prophesying about is yet for an appointed time, it's going to surely come. Now, they still were wrong about the event, but But Ellen White makes it clear in the book Early Writings and in Great Controversy that Habakkuk 2, verses 2 and 3, is referring to the experience of the Millerite movement and the Second Advent movement coming in to 1844. And they were told to write the vision of the 2300 days down and to make it plain on the tables, which were the charts. And then the preachers who proclaimed it could run around and proclaim it to those who they shared the message with because the vision of the 2300 days was for an appointed time. Now, you may be asking, so what does that have to do with reproof? I thought God was going to send a message of reproof. And if the message of reproof comes and I receive the message of reproof, then I will be able to withstand the attack of the Chaldeans. And what does that have to do with justification by faith? Well, the 2300-day prophecy points us to the cleansing of the sanctuary. Well, what does that have to do with justification by faith? That's where verse 4 makes a lot more sense. Now, listen carefully here. This is such an important point. Verse 4. Here's the reproof. So the reproof was coming. The Chaldeans are about to overrun God's people. And then it's like, yeah, you have this message to give. 2,300 days, rise of the second advent movement. Jesus is going from the holy place to the most holy place to begin the cleansing of the sanctuary. And now here comes the reproof. Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. In other words, there are a lot of people in the movement that are proclaiming the 2300-day message that Jesus went into the most holy place on October 22, 1844 to begin the work of the cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven, and yet God is saying, I'm working to cleanse the sanctuary in heaven from sin, but I have a bunch of people in the church whose souls are lifted up and they're not upright, meaning they are not righteous. God is saying, I have a bunch of proud Adventists to deal with. Here's the message of reproof. And here's the thing. 
The Chaldeans are threatening to overrun God's people. Well, what's the sin of Babylon? It's pride. Is this not great Babylon that I have built for the glory of my majesty and the glory of my kingdom? Look at what I have done. Oh, if God says he's going to change the kingdom from gold to silver to brass to iron to iron and clay, I'll do something even better than that. I'll just keep the kingdom all gold. And then Belshazzar, oh, Daniel, yeah, oh, so my knees are knocking and I'm scared about the handwriting on the wall, but yeah, you're, aren't you one of those captives from the Jewish nation? The sin of Babylon is the sin of pride. And God says, I have a message of reproof for you that you need to accept, because if you don't accept this message of reproof, you are going to be overrun by the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. And what God is saying is, you know, you may think that because you understand the 2300-day prophecy and because you understand the points of our faith, and I hope you do, and if you don't, I encourage you to study those things because it leads you to Jesus. But he's saying, if you think that just knowing those things and being good at those things will allow you to stand at the last day, it won't be enough if you're not connected to the Lord and if your heart is full of pride. You know, I remember a few years ago I was preaching a sermon at my in-laws church when they still lived in Michigan. They moved to, to Dunlap, Tennessee now. And for those of you who don't know my father-in-law, his name is Dr. Gerard Domsky. He taught at the seminary for years. And it's kind of interesting to preach a sermon in front of your theologian father-in-law because he certainly knows a thing or two. And, um, you know, he's humble about it, but he, he does know a few things. And I was preaching a sermon, and I was just kind of preaching away, and somehow I had it in my mind, you know, you look at the seven churches of Revelation, and the Laodicean church is the only church that receives a, a, a rebuke without any commendation from God. And so I'm like, I'm just preaching away. This church is such a bad church, and it's wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, and it doesn't receive any commendation from God. This is the worst church of the seven churches. And then I went on and made some other points, and, you know, people came up afterwards, oh, I was so blessed by your message, and so forth. Well, that evening, I was staying at their house. Uh, My father-in-law approaches me, and he's like, I have a question for you. I'm like, oh, no. Do you really think the Laodicean church is the worst church of the seven? I'm like, "Uh uh-oh, he's obviously got a a point here. I'm like, well, tell me what you think. He's like, you do realize that the fourth church, Thyatira, says it has the seat of Satan, and that's the church of the beast power? It's like, ooh, yeah, good point. Now, I could have said, and here's what we will do if we're too proud to take a reproof. I could have said, hey, you know what, thanks for sharing, but I mean, there were still God's people in the church of Thyatira, and they also received a commendation, and did Laodicea receive a commendation? What do you have to say about that, huh? But we do that, right? We'll do that sometimes. Even when someone will show us clear biblical evidence to show us why what we might believe or do or practice or live or say could be wrong, we'll have pride well up within us so that we'll just entrench ourselves into what we, we've said or what we believe or whatever it is. And that's pride. And God is saying, behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him. And then here is the, the clenching line. But, Here's the contrast. But the just shall live by his faith. So there's this distinct distinct contrast between the righteous who live by faith and the unrighteous who are not upright, but who are full of pride. And this is the great struggle that Adventism that we will personally deal with. And this isn't necessarily even an issue that you can blame on decisions that are made at higher up levels or whatever this is a heart issue for each one of us are you full of pride or are you righteous by faith through the grace of jesus christ now here's the amazing thing habakkuk 2 verses 2 and 3 show that there is a vision with an appointed time that points to the time that god is going to cleanse the sanctuary in heaven that work of cleansing began in 1844. Do you know when it's going to be finished? You, you realize Hebrews 2 verse, verse 4 tells us when. 
the sanctuary in heaven will be cleansed when the proud in Adventism are humbled. When the pride of Adventism is humbled and the just live by the faith of Jesus, then the sanctuary in heaven will be cleansed. Isn't that amazing? That's why Ellen White says in Testimonies to Ministers, page 456, what is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which it is not in his power to do for himself. You know, there's this tendency for us in Adventism to be proud of our accomplishments. I can speak for myself. You know, I, by the grace of God, he's been doing a work of humbling me in the last year. I've had some very challenging experiences in my personal life, at my work, and so forth, and I can't get, give you specific details. I can just simply say that God has been doing a work of humbling me, because here's what can happen to anybody, and I'll just tell you what could happen to me. You know, I could say, well, you know, look at me. I mean, I went to Loma Linda, and I'm a doctor, and I preach, and I go around, and I help patients in my practice, and I preach sermons, and people are blessed by them, and people tell me how they're blessed, and people at my work tell me how I've helped them, and wow, this is pretty good, and if I don't stay connected to the Lord, I could become like Nebuchadnezzar and say, is this not a great life that I have built for a good reputation throughout the Adventist community? And the Lord who loves us too much to let us stay, stay that way will sometimes nudge us and sometimes nudge us not so gently to remind us that the glory comes from him and the glory goes to him. And that could be true of anything that you do. It's not specific to my line of work. It could be true for pastors or accountants or teachers or you name it. Pride is an easy trap to fall into. But when, the, when God lays the glory of man in the dust so that people aren't saying, oh, wow, look at the glory of preacher so-and-so or the glory of teacher so-and-so or this or that or whatever, but we're looking at the Lord so that people are like, the Lord touched my heart. You know, I would hope and pray that when you walk away from this message, you're thinking about how the Holy Spirit touched your heart and how he brought conviction to your mind. And when, the, when our glory is laid in the dust and we stop taking glory to ourselves because we don't have it within ourselves to do anything good anyway, when we realize that we don't have the power to do anything good, that anything good in our life comes from God, and that all the glory goes to him, and when we accept the forgiving grace of Jesus, and when we forgive as he forgives, and when we surrender ourselves fully to him so that he can live his righteous life through us, and when he, we allow him to humble us, then we experience justification by faith so that now we are humble people who are forgiven and forgiving and kind and Christ-like so that now God can pour out his spirit upon us. That's justification by faith. And that's why in Maranatha 2.49 we read, there must be a purifying of the soul here upon the earth in harmony with Christ's cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven. There needs to be some purifying of our souls here on this earth. Some of us here tonight are struggling with pride. Some of us are struggling with resentment, bitterness. And God wants to touch our heart tonight. Some of us came here tonight. Oh, we're going to hear another message. We came to get a blessing. But you know, God has a specific blessing for you to receive tonight. And that blessing is justification by faith. That blessing is to trust fully in his forgiving grace. That blessing is to 
forgive that brother or sister that hurt you. And that might mean that some of you might need to talk to somebody and extend the hand of forgiveness and to truly mean it, not, not in a checklist way, but from the heart, truly extend forgiveness. And it also means, the, blessing, the other blessing God has for you is to experience what it means to be fully surrendered to Him. And to allow Him to lay your glory in the dust. The last verse I'm going to show you, it's very familiar, Luke 18. 10 to 14, two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man, that man being the publican, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. And you know, this can happen. This is my last point. But you know, we can say, God, I thank you that I'm not like the people in those other churches. We go to church on the right day. We eat the right food. We wear the right clothes. And look, I'm for all of those. I'm for dress reform, health reform, seventh-day Sabbath worship. You, all, you, you list everything that the Bible says, I'm for it. But those are not standards to then make us proud of how we're better than everybody else because we're sinners in need of the grace of Jesus just like everybody else. So all of those things are simply to help us to be protected from worldly influences. And as we keep our eyes on Jesus, we will be like the publican who says, if it wasn't for God's grace, I would be like those people too. And so this is the introductory message to our weekend meetings tomorrow morning for church, I'm going to be, and I have a short nugget also before Sabbath school, but for church, I'm going to be speaking especially of sanctification, and then in the afternoon, we're going to do more of a current events prophetic overview of where we're at in prophecy, so that's a good afternoon type topic, but for Friday night, I just, I just felt impressed and convicted to talk to you about justification by faith. It's one thing to know what it is. It's another thing to experience it by faith. So I just want the Holy Spirit to bring conviction to your heart. When you go home this evening, spend some time with the Lord and ask Him, Lord, what areas do I need to surrender in? Who do I need to forgive? Who do I need to extend forgiveness to? How can I allow your spirit to humble me so that people won't see pride within me but will see your glory and your character that's that's my challenge for you tonight amen so why don't we close with a word of prayer let's bow our heads father in heaven we come before you and we humble ourselves realizing that we are but dust and that our glory is nothing it's zero compared to the glory of God. May we truly learn what it means to give glory to God, not glory to man. May we allow you to humble us and to teach us to accept your forgiving grace and to be forgiving as you are forgiving and to be surrendered to you fully. And Lord, I pray that someday soon, as we see this world falling apart all around us, that we would humble ourselves and allow the Holy Spirit to be poured out upon us. Forgive us, Lord. I didn't even say this in the sermon, but forgive us for how we fight in the church about COVID the way the world fights. Please humble our hearts. And help us to see each other the way God sees us. 
And may we be converted and humbled and ready to receive the outpouring of the latter rain. So thank you for this time that we've had to reflect on these thoughts and these topics. And may Jesus come soon and may we be ready to meet him, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.